Hello, this is Hannah and welcome to the Becoming Who You Are podcast. Each episode focuses on a topic to do with personal development and self-growth. For more information about Becoming Who You Are, you can look at the website which is at www.becomingwhoyouare.net. You can also email me with your questions and comments at hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. Today I wanted to talk about why I don't like the phrase self-improvement. I'm going to start by reading an article that was in the New York Times last November and it's called Pursuing Self-Improvement at the Risk of Self-Acceptance, written by Alina Tujand. So she writes, Sometimes I get tired of always striving to be better, of knowing there are ways, endless ways, I can improve myself or members of my immediate family. When I feel really down, I think of how far we have to go. We could, for example, start our own vegetable garden, use that homegrown produce to make delicious and healthy meals, and compost the leftovers in the composter we don't have yet. Then we could turn off, or even throw out, the television, and read to each other from the classics while sitting in our hand-carved chairs. It's not going to happen. Not that any one of those ambitions is impossible. They're just not a priority. Still, at various times, they feel as if they should be, except maybe the hand-carved chairs. Self-improvement is a deeply embedded American trait, something other cultures find both admirable and amusing. The notion that we can constantly make ourselves better is, in theory, a great idea. But when does it become too much? There's a tendency to seek and seek and seek and never find, said Kristen Muller, creator of the website selfhelpjunkie.com. The motto, stop waiting, start living. It becomes one more addiction. It's not that trying to find ways to improve ourselves is a bad thing, not at all. A man's reach should exceed his grasp, the poet Robert Browning wrote. But when we're constantly reaching, rather than occasionally being satisfied with what we have in front of us, that's a recipe for perpetual dissatisfaction. We grew up with the idea that we can do anything, said Holly Schwartz Temple, a professor of law at West Virginia University and co-author of Good Enough is the New Perfect, Harlequin 2011. But we took that to mean that we have to do everything, and many women took it as you have to do everything perfectly. Ms. Temple and her co-author, Becky Bipre Gillespie, a former journalist, surveyed about 1,000 mothers in their 30s and 40s nationwide and interviewed about 100 for their book. They found that the women broadly fell into two categories, never enoughs and good enoughs. Never enough women felt like they had to be the best at everything and often agreed with the sentiment that I need to be a superstar even if it kills me, Ms. Temple said. Those in the good enough category were, as is self-evident, fine with not being the best as long as they felt they were doing pretty well. But more important than how these women described themselves was how they described their lives. The never enoughs more often described their marriage as poor or even a disaster, Ms. Temple said. The good enoughs were more satisfied and happier in their marriages, and they were just as likely to advance in their careers as the never enoughs. None of this may seem particularly new. You can't have it all. Perfection is the enemy of the good. But the struggle to find the balance between stagnation and stress, sinking into a rut or racing on the hamster wheel, resonates even more now in these economically down times, when even your best efforts don't seem to be reaping the rewards you expected. In our culture, there are so many different messages about being successful, and we try to implement all of them, Ms. Gillespie said. We need the courage to choose which definition of success we want, and the courage to realize that we may explore and seek, but there are often no answers, or not the ones that we want, said Ms. Muller, who wrote the book Waiting for Jack, about her attempts to get in contact with Jack Canfield, author of Chicken Soup for the Soul. The book's title and theme refer to her realisation that she, like so many people, was waiting for someone to provide the answers instead of looking inside herself. It's natural for a lot of people to search for something more, Ms. Muller said, or something happens and they want to make sense of it. But we can't go around with the idea that, one day I'll arrive, one day I'll be whole, she said. It's an illusion that one day I'll be fixed. Such constant searching, she said, leads to a sense that you're waiting to live your life rather than living it, or you'll feel that you're always falling short, because rarely is the road to self-improvement easy or straightforward, 
and it's certainly not the same for everyone. On her blog, Ms. Muller listed, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, the signs of a self-help junkie, including these. You could own a small island in the Caribbean for the amount of money you've spent on seminars, retreats, coaches, workshops and books, and yet you're still not satisfied. After each course you take, you claim that you now know you are, as per you are perfect just as you are, but then you hear about this new course that really sounds perfect and you secretly think, maybe this one will be it. Trying to figure out ways to make ourselves better is nothing new. Dale Carnegie's seminal How to Win Friends and Influence People was first published in 1936. The first 12-step program, Alcoholics Anonymous, began a year before that in 1935. This striving for self-improvement and the belief that we can all achieve success if we just work hard enough and figure out the right path has political, not just personal, ramifications. David Brooks, a New York Times columnist, wrote in a 2003 op-ed column that Americans always had a sense that the great opportunities lie just over the horizon in the next valley with the next job or the next big thing, adding, none of us is really poor, we're just pre-rich. That idea that we can all potentially occupy the executive suite is one of the reasons that Americans have been less ready than some other cultures to protest income inequality, said Daniel Letwin, an associate professor of history at Pennsylvania State University. But Occupy Wall Street and its offshoots may indicate a sea change. Clearly, throughout US history, there's been two competing streaks among Americans. Acceptance of, even admiration for, the wealthy when people buy into notions of fluid mobility and equal opportunity and indignation when the inequalities of wealth and power become too grotesque, when the prospects for ordinary people stall, no matter how hard they're trying and the system seems rigged, Professor Letwin said. Occupy Wall Street can be seen both as a rebellion and as an acknowledgement that most of us won't ever reach the pinnacles of power, and perhaps don't even want to, Ms. Temple said. The reality, she said, is... A lot of people are finding that I don't want to aspire to what I always thought I wanted to aspire to. Of course, I still hope one day to grow the beautiful tomatoes and tasty zucchini and cook up lovely meals with my homegrown bounty. It's not an impossible dream, but I'll put aside the composting for now and leave the television where it is. After all, as we've learnt, there's no point in pushing this self-improvement thing too far. So I thought this was a really interesting article and it picks up on something that I've kind of felt for a while around the self-improvement movement and um, it leaves me feeling both inspired and sad. It leaves me feeling inspired because I agree with a lot of the author's points and sad because it highlights a pretty big issue in the personal development world which is the concept of self-improvement. I don't like the phrase self-improvement. I've used it in the past, but as I learn more about myself and about human nature, I've grown to dislike its implications, that we should better ourselves and we're, that we're not good enough as we are. A lot of personal development activities and approaches are based on the idea that we need to change to become happier, that if we're not as happy as we want to be right now, that must be because there's something wrong with us or with our lives or with our mindset. Actually, I would say that if we're not totally happy with our lives right now, it's because there's a conflict between our genuine, authentic experience of the world and between how we've been conditioned by other people to experience it. For example, I am afraid of spiders. I think they're creepy, disgusting, and when it comes to fight or flight mode in the face of a house spider, I take the flight every time. If I have expressed my fear of spiders in the past and people have listened, accepted and respected my feelings, I will value my fear and respect it myself. If, on the other hand, my feeling of fear has been disregarded, minimised and I've been told, it's only a spider, it's more scared of you than you are of it, don't be so silly, calm down, etc, etc, I will start to deny my experience and also disregard my feelings myself. My organismic experience hasn't changed, I'm still afraid of spiders, but those statements become self-talk and cause an internal conflict that can lead to difficult feelings. But rather to work to fix that conflict and become more authentic, we're told that we need to improve. The not good enough story, once it's there, is especially hard to let go of, but needs to be questioned. 
Not good enough compared to what? Who defines what good enough actually is? Well, the answer is that we do, and only we can. We know ourselves better than anyone else, and only we are qualified to decide what is good enough for us and what isn't. No one else can tell us what we should or shouldn't be doing to make our lives better. They can tell us what worked for them, and that might be useful, but the problem with issuing a catch-all prescription is that everyone is different. The only way to decide what is good enough for us and what isn't is to develop our own standards of good enough, not compared to other people's standards of good enough, not compared to what society thinks should be good enough, but based on our own values and on reality. Personal development is about getting to know ourselves better, learning more about what makes us tick, working out what's important to us and what's not, digging deep and acknowledging the things that we're afraid to acknowledge. It's about learning to acknowledge every part of ourselves, the aspects of our personality we like and those we feel less comfortable with. This is the challenge. Can we accept things about ourselves that are difficult without feeling like we need to change them? Personal development isn't about improving or fixing ourselves. It starts with knowing and accepting every facet of our being. Because once we know and accept every facet of our being, every part of ourselves, even those parts that we're not so comfortable with, then we can start to be more authentic and we can start to be more ourselves. So before the end of the episode, I'd like to mention today's resource. This is a book called The Road Less Traveled by M. Scott Peck. This is a great introduction to personal development and self-awareness. It's one of the most popular self-help books published, and it contains some real nuggets of wisdom around self-responsibility and our internal development. There were parts of this book I didn't like, and parts of it I loved. And as with all these resources, not everything will suit everyone, so I recommend checking it out and cherry-picking the bits that work for you. So thank you for listening. Remember, you can find more material like this, as well as resources, tools, and much more at www.becomingwhoyouare.net. I look forward to talking to you very soon.